University of Western Washington, and it will last until 2.30. Before we start, I wanted to let you all know that this session will not be recorded. Additionally, to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, will it be recorded, Dr. Shakel? Yes, okay, so then great, we will record this. Um, so, um, if you do not wanna be recorded, then you may turn off your camera and to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, I'm gonna request that we um, follow a few rule sessions here. Sorry, session rules. Uh, one mic, one voice, so only one person will speak at a time. We're gonna respect all identities. This includes pronouns, nationalities, ethnic groups, et cetera. This is a safe space. Don't feel discouraged. We're all welcomed and engaged uh, in asking questions. Only one question for each person. Um, out of respect for others and our time, please stick to just asking one question unless we do have additional time at the end of this meeting. Only speak for yourself and no one else. Please do not name call or use derogatory comments, questions of any kind. Failure to comply will result in your termination from the session. Please keep the chat clear of traffic and only use it to propose questions. If you write questions in the chat, I will happily propose them at the end of the session to Dr. Shakel, and you are also welcome to unmute yourself at the end. If you raise your hand, um, we can unmute you and you can ask your question on your own. Now that we're all on the same page, it's time to introduce Dr. Myron Shakel. Myron didn't take the most direct path to where he is today. In fact, he failed out of college the first time he went. His life experience that he gained in the years that he took off from school helped him realize his passion for evolutionary biology. Um, his Tarsha research has been featured in Nat Geo's Next Wave and Myths, Magic, and Monsters. He's written a few really cool articles I can share the links with in the chat. Um, I'm really excited for him to share some information about the work he's done and his personal life experience. So without further ado, Myron Shakel. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Courtney. First of all, I have a question. Um, how do I thank? Uh, how do I uh, share my screen, share my slides? Hello, doctor. On the bottom of your screen, where you uh, mute your mic and you have your camera icon, there's a little share button. It should be a square button with an arrow pointing straight up. It's and, grayed uh, out. Oh, it's grayed out. It um, says open system preferences. Maybe it needs permission to share the screen or something. Hmm. Let's see. I don't know. I just let's see. Um, I. Yes, it needs to enable the permission in order to access the share button. Could you repeat that, please? Oh, uh, yes, you do need to open up your system preferences and enable the uh, allow it to access to your computer. Okay, and so I'm in privacy. Uh, it says that I can record the screen. But yes. I have that checked. What else do I need to check in here so that it can use? Uh, once you hit allow and then hit OK, you should be able to use the share button. OK, it may want me to quit and restart. So how about if I quit and then re-enter the meeting in just a moment? That's probably a good idea. <laughs> OK, I'll be right back, everyone. Go. Uh, do you know your hometowns? Just you know, introduce yourselves. I'm also going to share in the chat here with everyone uh, one of the articles I really enjoyed reading from Dr. Shakel. He's got a lot of really neat press um, that's out there, and his bios have been very open about his personal experiences. Um, so I do recommend if you want to give him a quick search, um, it's a great idea to, to get a little background information on his journey into primatology and where he is today. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Um, or any feedback on how you all are enjoying the conference? We're always pleased to incorporate any of your feedback. We're really glad to have you here today. Um, Ashton has put this together for us and it's been a really awesome opportunity to make new connections and meet people. And um, at the end of this week, don't forget, we do have a social. So it'll be a gather where you guys can come um, join us for you know conversing with whoever you found interesting, whoever you didn't get a chance to meet well. And it looks like Dr. Shikel is back. Are you able to share your screen now? Lovely, thanks guys.
Dr. Shakel, uh, I just want to make sure you know you are muted, but we are currently working on getting you unmuted. Unmute me. How about that? Is there that better? you go. Yep, all set. Okay, Thank great. You. Okay, wonderful. So I apologize for the uh, the little delays here. We're five minutes behind schedule. So I'll have to zoom through it. No, we should have plenty of time to get through this. Uh, can you hear me and see my slides okay? Great. Um, so uh, let's see. My thought today is to come and talk about how we teach tarsiers. Tarsiers oftentimes get maybe a slide, sometimes a lecture. Um, and so let's sort of look at how it's been done and what we can do to perhaps make it do better. Uh, I wanna thank the organizers here of the Primatology Conference for inviting me. Uh, it's a lot of work for people to do, but thank you very much. And um, I do hope that this is being recorded and I hope that it can be uploaded to whatever you're going to use and, uh, and it will be there for as long as, you know, people are not yet bored of my talk. Okay, so a little bit about me. So I, I got a bachelor's in anthropology from UCLA, but as Courtney mentioned, that was my second time around. First time I managed to fail out with a 0 0.6 GPA, um, but, you know, I think Courtney really misunderstood it. This was not failure. I was quite a success. I could set the high score on any Dig Dug machine on campus. Um, and then I went uh, to Washington University in St. Louis and I got a master's and then a PhD in uh, anthropology. And I spent about 14 years of my life or a little bit more if you counted every single day on the passport that I was over there, not including the time I came back for, for visits and so forth. Um, during my pre-doctoral and postdoctoral work, um, notably among it, I had a postdoctoral research fellowship from 2003 to 2005, where I was based in uh, Indonesia, the University of Indonesia. And uh, from 2006 to 2008, then I was at the National University of Singapore. I went back to the United States for several years, and then I took a job in Korea for a while. And over the years, I did things like uh, I became a member of the IUCN Primate Specialist Group. And for that group, I do the red listing for uh, tarsiers and uh, Sulawesi primates. I met Jane Goodall, and she asked me to get in touch with her people and help them set up the Jane Goodall Institute Singapore, which I did. And it's now being run, run wonderfully there by the people there. And then in 2015, I was invited to be a member of the uh, IPBES Asia Group, which met in 2015. This is the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So that's a little bit about what I've been doing. Uh, once upon a time, long ago, I was a paleontologist. And here are some pictures from the Fayum, Egypt, um, and uh, paper that came out of some of my work as an undergraduate on the dentition of a, an Eocene primate, uh, Diceolemur pacificus. But then I switched and now I'm a primatologist. I study the evolutionary ecology of tarsiers. And so let's begin here with a little talk about my research and conservation agenda in perhaps just one slide if we can. And so I study primate evolution, ecology, and conservation. And I'm really interested in issues of dispersal, speciation, and ecological differentiation with what, within what's uh, one of the most unusual primate species. Uh, the overall career objectives that I've had are to find out how many species of tarsier exist today. There were maybe three or four or five when I began my work. How did they, have, or at least they were recognized, obviously they were all there, uh, but how do we recognize them? So how and why did they evolve? Um, and then how can we use tarsiers to promote effective conservation? 
And I have some research questions that I'm working on, like what do tarsiers tell us about the historical biogeography and the distribution of biodiversity in these areas that we see in the map over here? Sulawesian blue, islands of the Southern Philippines, uh, which were all part of an ice age landmass that some people call Greater Mindanao. And then uh, Western tarsiers over here on Borneo and parts of Sumatra and a few small islands. Sunda land was also an Ice Age landmass, but it was connected to Asia. And so it's sort of peculiar that um, they are on the east side of Sunda land, but not on the west side. And it happens that there was a, an Ice Age river that flowed right through here. Uh, Paleobiogeographers call it the Sunda River. How come tarsiers can cross Wallace's line from Borneo and get to Sulawesi or from Sulawesi maybe get to the Philippines, but they can't cross maybe the Musi River? That's an interesting question. Um, so how do primates and other taxa disperse across open oceans is one of the things that I've been looking at. Uh, requested to annotate the shared content. Don't know what that means, but sure, go ahead. Um, why are there no sympatric tarsier species? Lots of species, no sympatry. Why? Why are some tarsiers social and some solitary? And we'll talk about that a little bit today. And then why are some tarsiers so much like gibbons in their social organization, their behavior, and their distribution? So these are things I've been uh, asking as I've learned more about tarsiers. Now, trying to advance here. So, Dr. Shakur, I, I'm yeah. not 100% sure what the annotation feature does. We did have an issue with it this morning, um, and that presenter did have to stop sharing the screen and re-enter the PowerPoint, um, as we all are still kind of learning WebEx, um, so I'm sorry. Oh, perfect. You got it to advance. That's great. Thank you. So, um, and now let's continue with a very brief nature film about my field work, as you can see it. I like to uh, inform my students and my watchers how much time they have to run off if they don't want to watch the video. This will be about five minutes and 12 seconds then. And I have to turn. Do you hear it? Another Asian species in the forests of Sulawesi is an even less likely contender as an ocean voyager. As the day folds quietly into evening, these animals are still asleep inside hollow trees. They live in close-knit family groups and have a lifestyle that turns daily ritual on its head. Tarsiers, tiny gremlins smaller than your hand. They have been sleeping all day, and it is only when night falls that the family wakes up. Tarsiers have huge eyes and ears to help them navigate in the pitch black forest. Their long bony fingers ensure they get a good grip as they leap from tree to tree. These are the only primates that live exclusively on live prey. Although its body is just six inches long, a hungry tarsier can leap up to six feet. Oh. The victim 
is always eaten head first. This minuscule mammal has an eerie talent for finding its next meal in the darkness. With dawn approaching, these creatures of the night return to their family tree. But before retiring, they sing a complex song. The entire family joins in a chorus of chirps that convey a range of Tarsier messages. Scientists have discovered that it's important for them to communicate with other Tarsiers in neighboring territories. In this evolutionary hothouse, new species evolve rapidly, and Tarsier expert Myron Shekel is trying to discover exactly how many different species there are. As dawn seeps into the forest, the Tarsiers fall silent. They will sleep the day away, tucked into their usual tree. In the afternoon, the scientists return. Shekel is the head of an international team following up on some intriguing research. They'll play the Tarsiers the recording of their own familiar song. The question is, will they recognize it? The Tarsiers are definitely interested. They not only recognize the sounds as Tarsiers, they reply, just as they might to a rival family. Then the tape is changed. This time, the family will hear the song of Tarsiers that live in another part of Sulawesi, which the team suspects may be a different Tarsier species. The family listens, but makes no reply. These sounds are so unfamiliar, they don't even seem to recognize them as Tarsiers, leading scientists to believe they might be separate species. Okay, there you go. So uh, that's a little bit about the work that I did. That's a little bit about the work that I did uh, for my dissertation research and that I've been continuing to do using uh, tarsier bioacoustics to help identify where tarsier species might be and then using genetics to help test that hypothesis and also looking at uh, morphological variation. These are what we call cryptic species uh, because they're very difficult to tell one species from another just by looking at them. And, uh, and then once we have that, once we have this map of where the tarsiers are, look at how all the other biodiversity of Sulawesi is organized and look at the geology the geological history of Sulawesi and see if we can understand the, the biogeographic processes. Um, now, set my research aside for a moment. Let's take a bigger picture about teaching tarsiers. And typically, uh, teaching tarsiers begins and ends with one or more tired old tropes. You know, the tarsier, these are the tired old tropes. But we can be excited about them because primatologists think that, you know, tend to think that tarsiers are really cool. So we can be the tarsier and then tell the tarsier the tired old tropes. And so we might say, you know, the tarsier 
is a mosaic of anthropoid and prosimian features. The tarsier is a living fossil. The tarsier is an enigmatic, pri enigmatic primate, a rarely seen and it's little understood. And then you might hear something about how the tarsier has big eyes, long legs. And look, if you're teaching it this way, please uh, understand, a lot of us have been doing it this way, it's okay. If your teacher taught it this way, please understand. This is a, has been very, very common. Um, and so if I have a little bit of fun with it, it's only uh, in the hopes that we start to teach a new story for tarsiers, um, perhaps a more accurate story that really helps primatology a little better. So we need to begin by dismantling these old tropes and then building a new story that's up to date. So first off, the tarsier is, the tarsier has, what's that all about? We don't say the lemur is this or the monkey is that or the ape is the other thing, no way. You know, so for start, tarsiers are taxonomically diverse. Here's our new thing, number one. Tarsiers are actually about as diverse phylogenetically as gibbons. Uh, having experienced a recent history of reclassification, as the Gibbons have, leading toward the recognition of we're getting close towards 20, we're moving up toward 20 and three genera. And we can find here the Eastern Tarsiers, which I classify in the genus Tarsius, the blue area, Sulawesi. The Philippine tarsier, which I classify in the genus Carlito, is in those islands of the southern Philippines. And the western tarsier, which I classify in the genus Cephalopacus, is in Sundaland. Now, like Gibbons, interestingly, tarsiers show little ecological variation among species and even among the genera. And as I said before, almost no sympatry. So in other words, as far as we know, in terms of niche, like what niche do the tarsiers fit or do they fill? Well, if we paint with a really broad brush, pretty much a tarsier is a tarsier is a tarsier. Except, unlike gibbons, tarsiers have diverse social systems. And tarsiers include one clade that is gregarious or social and a second clade that is solitary. And so here's kind of our second new thing. I don't know how much this gets taught. Um, all tarsiers were taught were, were classified in a single genus until Colin Groves and I broke them into three genera. Where, where else in primates do you find a single genus that has this diversity of social organization? So um, some of this comes from work that I did with uh, Yoon Jung E from the Primate Research Institute for Cognition and Ecology in, at Iwa Women's University in Korea. And uh, Yoon Jung presented this at uh, the IPS conference in 2014 at Hanoi, where we looked at uh, social monogamy, is it primitive or derived in Tarsiety, Haplorhini, Primates, uh, and we did it from uh, inferences with tarsier duetting behavior. So uh, remember, there's social monogamy, there's pair bonded. I don't want to get too much into the difference here. Main thing is, is you can either be uh, solitary, tend to, when you find individuals, they tend to be solitary, or you can find them congregating in gregarious groups where they're clearly social interaction, typically like families related, some, at least some of them are related. And so the clade that is social, genus Tarsius, the ones from Sulawesi, they're very gibbon-like. They're pair bonded. They have a duet call. They live in family groups. It's typically one adult male, one adult female. They're immature offspring, but sometimes it gets a bit more complicated. Sometimes there are extra adults of one or both sexes in that way, very gibbon-like. And actually, this isn't even new, but it's gone mostly overlooked. Um, you can hear, see all the way back to 1980 in IJP, 
the McKinnons published on the behavior of wild spectral tarsiers and wrote, spectral tarsiers form close pair bonds and live in pairs. Most family groups consist of a solid, a solely, ah, pardon me, most uh, family groupings consist solely of a mated pair and immature animals. And this is really weird because consider then that either sociality evolved independently in tarsiers or else was lost in the Western Philippine clade. You know, and either way, you know, woohoo, we've got something really interesting here just in tarsiers. And so it raises the question of the social organization of stem tarsiers. Were they social or were they solitary? And so from our work, uh, between myself, Myun Jong, and the other people in our group there, our inference was that um, social monogamy and duetting are primitive for Tarsiidae, uh, and the inference, therefore, is that it's primitive for Haplorhini as well, and that primitive Haplorhini, uh, primitive Haplorhines were social. And so, through our work, we hypothesized, therefore, that stem tarsiers were gregarious and lived in small social groups. This is our new thing number three here. Now, here's another interesting thing. New thing number four. Crown tarsiers are much older than had been suspected, at least when I began my work. So you can see that crown tarsiidae is estimated to be more than 20 million years old approximately the same age as crown hominoidea, uh, even a little bit older if you look at this uh, phylogram. Now, again, this isn't really new, you know, 11 years old, uh, 11 years old, sorry, uh, eight years old, a little bit more than eight years old, not really all that new. Um, but what it means is that you are more closely related to a gibbon than an Eastern tarsier is to a Western or Philippine tarsier. Oh, and by the way, just crown tarsius, just the Sulawesian ones, that is approximately equivalent in age to crown hylobatidae. So in other words, the entire gibbon radiation fits inside the radiation of genus tarsius, at least in terms of time. So why do we hear so little about this? Well, except for the old tropes, tarsiers are just often ignored within primatology. And so back at the physical anthropology meetings in 2015, my colleagues, my tarsierologist colleagues and myself, we uh, sort of teased our colleagues a little bit. So Sharon Gursky, Stefan Merker, and myself, we um, submitted an abstract called Testing the Undersampled Tarsier Hypothesis a little bit humorously stating that studies of primate phylogenetics, molecular evolution, and social evolution continue to employ what we call the undersampled tarsier hypothesis. Briefly, this is an implicit hypothesis within primatologies that tarsiers need not be sampled as densely as other primate taxa of similar phylogenetic age. So you think of any comparative study and how many hominoids you know, whether it's homo, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, how many are there in that study? How many are represented? And then how many will the tarsiers be represented by? One, sometimes two or three. So teaching tarsiers these days, it's about building up a new story that's up to date. So remember, tarsiers are, this is our first thing, and we can still be excited about them. Tarsiers are, this is gonna be cool, I hope. So they're a mosaic of anthropoid and prosimian features of living fossil. Well, look, everything is a mosaic of primitive and derived features. Courtney, would you do me a favor? Would you hold your hand up like that? Count those one, two, three, five, five. You're reptilian. You're so primitive. Your hand is reptilian. What's gone wrong? You know, you've got this big brain and the reptilian hand. What's happened here? Look, everything is a mosaic of primitive and derived features. We need to find out what's primitive and what's derived. 
Parser is a living fossil. Everything's a living fossil. The question is, what has been fossilized? Parsers have big eyes, long legs, etc. Yada yada yada. Well, so let's start. What are parsers? Are they haplorines? Is it haplorhini, prosimii, or uh, tarsiaformes, as opposed to being the outgroup, uh, the sister taxon to a simiolimuriformes? If we went back about 20 years ago, um, Yoder wrote, using likelihood ratio tests, one topology cannot be shown to be significantly preferred to other, to alternative topologies. And that was based on the largest primate study uh, of primate DNA, DNA sequence study at that time, which was Murphy et al. 2001. So basically back at that time, Look, I'm telling you, everybody back then thought haplorhini was real and these other two things were bogus. But when you really looked at the data, when Yoder compared it and tested them for statistical significance, you couldn't choose any of them. None of them were statistically significantly better than the other. Well, we've collected more data and then there was a whole genome. Um, and so hard to get all published uh, evidence in 2013 uh, that was fairly convincing of these three possible hypotheses, of these three uh, possible hypotheses, uh, fairly convincing data that uh, tarsiers belong in haplorhini with anthropoidia. Okay, not a big surprise there, but I think the surprise is that molecular ev evidence mostly supports a monophyletic haplorhini, but the level of support has probably been overstated at times over the years. And it's always just gonna be a hypothesis. We're never gonna know exactly what happened, but let's go with haplorhini now. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, first of all, one of the things is that any way you slice it, stem haplorhini is a very, very short branch maybe four to seven million years, and that's it. And that's all that you and I shared, that's all the evolution that you and I shared with a tarsier back 60 million years ago or so. So, you know, it's a, just a tiny little bit of haplorine evolution. This raises some very interesting questions, like what are the synapomorphies of haplorhini and which are the synapomorphies of anthropoidia? When I was taking this long time ago, that list of haplorhine synapomorphies was huge. And if you looked, and this is all the things that tarsiers supposedly shared with um, the anthropoids. And the list of anthropoid uh, synapomorphies was comparatively small. Now what's happened over the years is that the molecular data is robustly solid of a, a monophyletic anthropoidia, but has only just kind of been so-so a little bit lukewarm about a monophyletic haplorhini. So you'd think that the morphological characters would be reversed. You'd find a few haplorhine synapomorphies and lots and lots of anthropoid. Um, and I think that that probably will be shown more and more in the future. But in the meantime, let's ask what are those Aplorine synapomorphies. And so when we build this story up, tarsiers become a key part of determining the very earliest synapomorphies that separate the anthropoid primates from the strepsirine primates. And let's face it, you know, I love lemurs and so forth and lorises and galagos, I like tarsiers. But when we talk about human evolution and primates, a lot of the action really starts to change and take place with the anthropoid primates. So what was the very first group of synapomorphies? What was the change that started this separation between the anthropoids and the strepsirines? We need to find out which of these things are primitive, which are derived, and what tarsiers fossilized. So for one, we have tarsiers lack a tapetum lucidum and possess a fovea like diurnal eyes. So like owl monkeys, tarsiers are secondarily nocturnal, but their ancestor had already made an adaptive shift to diurnality. This is one of the inferences. Can we prove it? No. But is it a reasonable inference? So far, yes. So the big eyes is probably derived. What about the long legs? Well, like almost all primates of the early Eocene, tarsiers have long legs and they've retained that vertical clinging leaping 
uh, mode of locomotion. And so this is from uh, some illustrations by one of Karsten Nemitz's publications. And we can see how tarsiers practice uh, VCL. Okay, so the big eyes probably derive. Um, the long legs, probably primitive. What about all those etceteras? Well, the tarsiers are just really unusual. The newborn might be 20% to 33% of the mother's body weight. And the linear measurements might be nearly 50% of the mother. This is a newborn, by the way, of the mother's body weight, uh, of the mother's linear measurements. The largest neonatal weight among primates. And so, you know, I, imagine a human who uh, stands, what's a common height, 160 centimeters or something like that. A female stands 160 centimeters and gives birth to an 80 centimeter infant. And let's say that this female human weighs 120 pounds and the offspring is 40 pounds. So this is sort of what we're thinking about. And nevertheless, the mother carries that infant in its mouth. And it's not like she's walking along the ground. She is leaping from tree to tree with this in her mouth. Okay, so definitely unusual. The births are always singletons. There's a no recorded case that I know of ever of tarsier twins. And yet the mother has retained two or three pairs of mammae. The gestation lake, insane. It's actually, it's a, almost six months. It's longer than the macaques that they're sympatric with, even though the macaques, <clears throat> a lot of these life history traits are uh, linked to body size. And uh, the macaques are like two orders of magnitude larger in body size, but actually have a shorter gestation length. What's happening there? You probably heard that like an owl, a tarsier can rotate its head 180 degrees in either direction giving it 360 degrees of mobility. There's no other mammal that can do this. It's probably an exaggeration to say that though. You could do it, but if you did, you'd probably just do it that one time and that would be it. Western and Philippine tarsiers have 80 chromosomes. This is the highest number of chromosomes among mammals and yet the Eastern tarsiers have only 46. So something wild happened there too. Uh, and I'm not sure if they were actually the first primate documented to use ultrasound and to hear ultrasound. I think they were the first to documented to do both of those, uh, meaning there may have been some recordings of ultrasound beforehand. Um, and here you can see that they are, uh, they use ultrasound up to and beyond 80 kilohertz. So they're up in the bat range. And yes, of course, tarsiers are really, really cool. But here's the problem. We teach tarsiers like they're a freak show. You know, it's like, which is the top primate freak, tarsiers or eye eyes? And it's hurting our effort to build a new story that's up to date. Look, if we're only gonna use one slide and if we're teaching the freak show, we're never gonna get any of the interesting material. Even if we have a whole lecture and we focus a lot on the, the, the freak show, we're, we're probably not gonna get very far. So um, let's stop teaching the old tropes. Let's focus on new information, you know, new, 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 like stuff that's been out for 40 years or so. So re-examine, let's re-examine some key features of primate evolution within this framework. Well, first of all, within this framework, the strepsorine haplorine dichotomy is as stark as night and day. Strepsorines, yes, there are some diurnal ones, but they appear to be, the ancestral condition appears to be primitive as the ancestral condition for primates is probably uh, nocturnal, sorry. So ancestral strepsorine, the stem strepsorine is probably nocturnal. The stem primate is not probably nocturnal. Mammals themselves, the Ancestrally, it's probably nocturnal. Look, you know, if you study primatology, you know that humans and the uh, catarrhini are really cool because we have tricolor vision. We trichromatic, we've got three opsin genes. And 
So we, you know, you've had it in your anthropology class, perhaps we can see the difference between the red apple and the green apple, and we think we're really cool. Well, you know, so what? Um, actually, birds and fish and things are tetrachromats. They've got four opsin genes. All that happened was mammals were ultimately reduced to just two opsin genes. And so the assumption is that they went through a very long period of nocturnality where color vision was not particularly helpful for them. So here we go. We have ancestral uh, strepsirines are probably nocturnal. Some got to Madagascar and uh, became diurnal. Ancestral haplorines are probably diurnal. Parsiers and owl monkeys probably went backwards, reversed, and became nocturnal. So tarsiers are secondarily nocturnal. And uh, we've got that little tiny bit of stem uh, haplorhine and this long list of anthropoids, uh, synapomorphy. So which evolved first and therefore together? And what can we find out? Well, first of all, tarsiers are social. We uh, reconstruct that the stem tarsiers are social, therefore stem haplorhine is likely to have been social. And so social monogamy involved in conjunction with what? These uh, features for diurnality, like loss of the tapetum lucidum, the fovea. Uh, they probably had a, pr a platyrine-like capacity for tricolor vision, like some platyrine females can be uh, trichromatic if they are heterozygous at their one opsin gene that's on the X chromosome. We also have this loss of, of organs related to the sense of smell, like the loss of the naked rhinarium. We have a partial loss of vitamin C biosynthesis. So you may know that you know, we need to get vitamin C or we get a disease, but that's not actually primitive. Vitamins typically indicate some kind of a genetic disease and uh, the strepsirines, as far as I know, uh, do biosynthesize vitamin C. Now, tarsiers were found to be able to biosynthesize vitamin C, but not at the same level that you would predict if they were um, strepsirines. And so that probably indicates, look, if you're, uh, if you're in a nocturnal habitat all the time, if you're in a cave, you might lose not just the ability for color vision, you might lose eyes altogether, or you might at least lose vision, you might have sightless eyes. If you have a diet that's loaded with vitamin C, that's very vitamin C rich, you might get a mutation to that gene that biosynthesizes vitamin C, who cares, doesn't matter. So it, it may indicate that right at the same time, social monogamy, diurnality, loss of uh, sense of smell, reduction, let's say, in the sense of smell, also happened or a, when there was a diet very rich in vitamin C. Also, year-round menstrual cycling. Tarsiers have a menstrual cycle, 24-day menstrual cycle. And probably many more if we start adding to this list. So all of these things happened at the same time in one big burst. And so for to teach tarsiers in one slide now, this would be my one slide. Tarsiers are the anthropoids that changed its mind. There's basically stem anthropoids that forgot to go extinct. They didn't have the good decency to go extinct like so many others did, but in not going extinct, what they fossilized are those anthropoid features that evolved first. Social monogamy involved in conjunction with the diurnal eye, reduced olfaction, di a diet rich in vitamin C, year-round breeding, and how many other features out there waiting to be named. If you wanted to add a second slide, you might add this one here about variation among tarsier genera. Uh, for instance, uh, they uh, form sort of a cline with the, the Western tarsiers being the least social, Eastern being the most social, and Philippine tarsiers tolerating sociality in captivity, um, but in the wild, typically they're not. Uh, these are the least vocal, these are the most vocal, these are intermediate. Uh, these two have 80 chromosomes, this one has 46. Now, Nemitz's work 40 odd years ago showed that um, while this animal here has the lowest intermembral index among primates, indicating the longest legs relative to arms. Actually, its cousin, the Philippine tarsier, is even more extreme. And then 
the Western Tarsier is the most extreme of all. So longest legs, shortest legs, intermediate. Same with the hands, the long hands indicating that they're probably not being used as much in locomotion. Shortest hands, intermediate hands, and then shortest ears. You can kind of see it here in this particular illustration. Shortest ears, longest ears, and intermediate ears. Okay, so there you go. You've had tarsiers in one slide. You've got a second slide just in case you, you wanted it. Uh, we've spent about a, a one lecture talking about them. Um, how about at now, after 27 years, uh, how far have I gotten in all of this? Um, well, first of all, it's a we for sure. There's a lot of us that have been involved over the years. How many species of tarsier exist today? Well, there's all of these. We're moving towards you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, something like that. Um, but there's gonna be more. So uh, I helped to supervise the master's thesis of uh, Talita Sumampao, uh, and we published in PLOS One er, about, just about a year ago today. Um, and uh, there may be some more in the areas that uh, Talita was looking at. And this is uh, my current PhD student, Zulianto Zakaria. Uh, he's a lecturer in uh, the biology department at uh, Universitas Negri Gorontalo. Um, and uh, we're getting very close. These are some, you can see this is from a survey he was doing on December 6th. We're getting very close to having a comprehensive map and having a very good idea of exactly how many there are at least for Sulawesi. How and why did they evolve? Well, partly biogeography, sure, and maybe some sexual selection, but we're a long, long way from having answers to these questions. What we really need first is to find out how many there are, where they're located, et cetera. Uh, how can we use tarsiers to promote effective conservation? Well, for starters, finally, they've all been red listed and updated. Thanks to the IUCN Primate Specialist Group for involving me in that. Um, We've done them all, and uh, they finally, the, this was from a workshop in Singapore in 2015, in November 2015, and they finally, a few, a few weeks ago, months ago, uh, they were finally uh, went online. And so you can find them there now. Um, and remember that tarsiers are flagships, uh, conserving nature wherever they're found. So, you know, eagle conservation is not just about eagles. Orangutan, I hope if you're doing orangutan conservation, it's not just about orangutans, but it's about preserving the habitat in Borneo and in Sumatra. Uh, and as we know, the panda is the worldwide symbol for, um, for conservation around the world. And so um, flagship species, remember they raise awareness and funds. Uh, and they're used as tourism mascots on the island of Bohol. Tarsiers are obviously really cool and uh, you can help. So tax deductible donations, at least in the USA, are accepted here through the Western Foundation. It goes directly and it helps to support the work that we're doing, like the work that, uh, that uh, Zulianto Zakaria is doing. Uh, we have other people getting involved all the time and uh, that money just goes straight to, uh, uh, you know, PayPal or whatever, it, it gets sent to Indonesia and then dispersed immediately to the people who are there. Uh, that apparently decided to repeat itself. And so that's all that I wanted to say to you today. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. And uh, I can take questions if you're interested. Did I stop the share? Should we talk? Does anybody? I'll leave, I'll leave it up for now. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, if anyone has a question, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and we can unmute you so that you can ask it or you're welcome to type it in the chat and I can pose it for you. I am sending requests for um, unmuting as we speak. Clayton, you're on. All right. Uh, Omamaids evolved in the Eocene here 
in North America. And so Tarsiers probably evolved around 34 million years ago in the Oligocene. Do you believe that they travel from North America into Southeast Asia? And do you believe that their ears and their ultrasound communication are a convergent evolution with bats? Um, I would say uh, that Beard, Chris Beard has the best program going on this and, or at least he got it started, which is that, um, look at what the sister taxa of primates is. It's the tree shrews and the demopterans and they're all right in Southeast Asia. And so that's really where that was happening. And I would expect that uh, Haplorhini evolved there too. The whether Omomyidae is is uh, monophyletic remains to be seen, and whether or not any of those North American uh, Omomyids have anything to do with true Tarsiidae remains to be seen as well. What we know is that we get really dead-on Tarsier uh, fossils from the Eocene of China, the Miocene of uh, Thailand and also from Pakistan. And so the Tarsier, the, the Tarsier fossils that really belong clearly within Tarsiidae uh, are found over in that, you know, Southeast Asia that defined very broadly, including Pakistan and, and China and stuff. Gotcha. Was, Do you think it's uh, the convergent evolution aspect of the ears in the ultrasound communication with bats? So ultrasound is a funny one because um, other mammals are found to communicate with it, like mice and so forth. And so there's no reason why. All ultrasound means is humans don't hear it in their normal range. And so our hearing is uh, capped at about 20,000 hertz. Mine, I've, you know, sort of the irony of the, the guy who studies bioacoustics has lost his hearing. That's why I'm wearing the headphones and so forth. Mine is dies at about... Uh, 10 or 11,000 hertz now, and I actually have special hearing aids that have a special Tarsier program built into them. So when I'm out in the field, I click the little thing and, and suddenly I can hear Tarsiers around me. But before I got those, I was like one of those blind people being led by the hand. I, I had to have a student who would hold my hand in the dark in the, and then point, squeeze my hand and point where the Tarsiers were because I couldn't hear them at all anymore. Uh, so anyway, um, is the ultrasound, who knows? Um, and the ears, again, it's not a question that I've really, really ever thought about. It would have to be, you know, first of all, bats. There was a while when we thought that bats were like a sister taxon to uh, primates, but that's not so much in vogue now. And it's becoming farther, it's becoming less and less likely. So uh, you'd have to really go back far, far, far in your cladogram. And at that point, you're talking about stuff so ancient, you know, you're some middle Mesozoic uh, mammal. I don't know. Were they using ultrasound? Maybe. Did they have really long ears that could, could triangulate on sound like that? Maybe. But uh, it would take a lot of work that I, I don't know too much. I haven't been there. But thank you for the questions, Clayton. We have a question in the chat. What do you love most about studying tarsiers? It's a cool question. It's a cool research question. So I'm definitely not one of those guys who, you know, at seven years old, opened a book about tarsiers and said, that's it. What happened was I was studying, you know, you saw, I studied uh, fossil primates. I was finding fossil omomyids in, uh, in Wyoming. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I switched and uh, in graduate school, I switched. I decided that I was going to, I wasn't going to do paleontology and I was going to work with uh, an extant group. And um, I'll tell you a true story, uh, uh, since many of us are probably anthropologists. At that time, at least, biological anthropologists had the reputation of being poor biologists. This is what I was told. And I didn't want that to be the case for me. So when I got to graduate school, I took the entire core curriculum, not just for anthropology, but also for uh, population biology. So I took their whole core curriculum too. And while doing that, there was a senior graduate student, uh, someone who was graduating with a PhD, uh, Carrie Shaw, 
And she was finishing a project that looked at crickets in Hawaii and how they all look like the same species, but they had different calls. And if you use this new stuff called, you know, genetic sequencing, new, new, new back then, mitochondrial DNA, that you could determine how many species they were and uh, examine the biogeography of the Hawaiian Islands. I thought, you know, Hawaiian crickets, you know, vocalization, not vocalizations, but uh, songs, acoustics, genetics. It sounds like that thing that I heard about Sulawesi tarsiers. So to me, uh, tarsiers, they were like crickets. They were a great, great uh, research system to look at the kinds of questions that I wanted to look at. When I was in paleontology, I wanted to look at how you identify species and how species evolve over time. Uh, and Wyoming is a great place to do that, you know, where you get very dense sampling. Uh, but anyway, so then I just switched to uh, tarsiers. And for me, tarsiers were just kind of like Hawaiian crickets. They allowed me to ask the same kinds of questions. Thanks so, very much for the question. Very cool connection. Um, somebody else asked that if newborn tarsiers um, are so large compared to their mothers, is the birth very difficult? Never asked one. Don't know. Um, I know that we had some births in captivity and um, the mother doesn't seem to uh, experience any problems. So you may know that like uh, human births, what what is hypothesized to constrict a human birth canal is the bipedalism, turning the pelvic bone sideways. Um, so tarsiers are not bipedal, and it may be that they can leave the um, that that the the birth canal is is really unrestricted in terms of how large it can get. Oh, well, I mean, I'm sure it's restricted in some ways, but not in the same way that humans are. Sure. Thanks for the question, though. Um, another question in the chat is what factors do you believe gave rise to such a large diversity on Sulawesi compared to the larger landmass on Borneo? Okay, well, so there you go is that it's the geological history of Sulawesi for sure, which began as an archipelago. So I like to refer to the proto Sulawesi archipelago. And um, so it's kind of like the Galapagos Islands. How come there's so much diversity in finches with the, the four islands and so forth? It's just that the um, A, Sulawesi wasn't like four islands. It's like eight, nine, 10, 11. It's many islands. And it's some of them still have not accreted on to Sulawesi itself, like uh, Siau Island or Sangi Island, like Salayar Island, the Kaleng Island. Um, so it was many islands, but also much tectonic activity caused a lot of it to smoosh together. So it looks like one island, but there's a research team that has been recovering where these sort of these ancient islands were, and they were probably isolated mountaintops. And so uh, a lot of it would be because of dispersal throughout a Sulawesi archipelago. But then also, just like the monkeys are divided, the Sulawesi macaques are divided into six, seven, eight taxa, depending which classification you want to use. Um, there's probably some range fragmentation that happens too, um, relating to Pleistocene, mostly Pleistocene events, like uh, oceans, lower, oceans lowering and rising up again. Um, so, a combination of dispersal throughout the proto Sulawesi archipelago, and then uh, then all the, the tips of the branches would be rearranged further uh, by Pleistocene vicariance events. That's a thought, anyway. But there's a lot more to work on that. That's really interesting. Um, someone else asked Is the rate of speciation higher in tertiaries than any other nocturnal primate? Oh, I wouldn't think so. I, I don't know. And I'm not really looking at the rate, but I wouldn't think so. You look at how many tax of mouse lemurs there are or something. Remember that it, it's not, it's sort of removing this perception that we might have had that tarsiers are closely related species. There's just not. Um, the uh, genus tarsi itself, just the Sulawesi ones, is as old as all of hylobatidae. So, you know, this is like, are gibbons like on some race to speciate? Um, I don't know. But another thing is, is that there has been some uh, interesting work on, um, uh, thanks Letitia. 
There has been some interesting work on how sexual selection can drive speciation on its own. And so that's something that is worth looking at further with tarsiers. But first we've got to get in, we, we need to know where they all are. Then we'll have uh, a uh, sort of a comprehensive comparative database to work with. I know with gorillas, it can be a bit complicated getting funding when there's multiple species, because the more broken up they are, the harder it is to get funds and grants to help um, support them and their ecosystems. Do you find that to be true in Tarshiers as well? Is it helpful to find more species or does that end up hurting the funding um, for protecting them later on? Well, no, um, it's both. Because remember that we work in primatology, which uses the undersampled tarsier hypothesis. So basically, tarsiers are all just one. And so it's all of the funding for all of the family tarsiidae. Um, you know, it all sort of goes one direction. Uh, but, and you know, action plans and stuff like that tend to be, you, know, you might have an individual action plan for every species of monkey and then the country doing their national plan may just throw all the tarsiers together in one group. So it's, it's two sides of a coin. One, tarsiers tend to be treated as just the tarsier and forget about it. Um, but in fact, there are many, many, many uh, taxa uh, and there's just not enough of us to work on it. So remember that like there's probably if you take everybody who's working on gorillas, or let's say everybody who's working on chimpanzees, there's probably 10 times as many, at least 10 times as many um, people just working on chimpanzees as there are maybe even species of, of tarsiers. And there's only, you know, three, four, five, six of us who do it. So we have fewer, there are, there are more tarsier species than there are people with PhDs who study tarsiers. Um, Whereas if you look at something like chimpanzees or gorillas, there's many, many times the number of species uh, of the, the people who are out there studying them. So like I say, it's a double-edged sword. And with that small group of primatologists actually specializing in tarsier research, do you find that that is a limiting factor? Does that help you be able to work more collaboratively as a group because you know who each other are and, and your bodies of work? Um, what is that like as a primatologist? Well, it's like I, I like to say, it's not really true that we hold our conferences in a telephone booth, but if we had to, we probably could. Um, so it happened that one day uh, I got a call when I was living in Indonesia, I got a call from, I forget who called first, Sharon or Stefan, but one of them called uh, and said they were in Jakarta. And I said, oh yeah, come on over. And then, uh, and then like an hour or two later, I got a call from the other one saying, they're in town. So Sharon and Stefan and Stefan's PhD student at the time, Christine Driller, who went on to get a PhD um, on Tarsiers, they just all happened to show up at my house on the same day just by accident. Um, and I would say that uh, we all have done a lot of work to maintain collegiality among us. So, uh, you know, we've all met each other's kids and um, uh, not, I, I've met Stefan's family, but uh, he didn't have kids last time I was there. Um, so we've done a lot of work to try and maintain collegiality. It's important, but it's not a given that it happens. That's for sure. Sure. That's really lovely. Um, those are all the questions that I have posed in the chat. If anyone else has anything you want to raise your hand or pose in the chat, we're happy to answer them. But it has been so nice to hear from you, Myron, and uh, you are such a delight. Your personality really shines in the way you talk about Tarshir. So I'm very glad we could listen to your discussion today. Well, thank you again very much.